Hi guys, you've got Ryan Cavender here from Stealth Products. Today we're going to look at a little bit of everything alternative controls. That means this is a pretty long presentation, probably the longest I'll ever do here. I'm going to go ahead and thank you for your time in advance and we'll get going into it. Today we're going to look at joysticks from Stealth, all of the other Motiv Movis items that are not joysticks. We're going to look at iConnect and take a little bit of a deeper dive into iDrive. So getting into the joysticks, we have a pretty broad line of joysticks to look at. So Stealth is committed to offering any solution any end user may need. So that being the case, we have partnered with Movis and began introducing their high-end alternative drive control items. And in doing so, we've created a pretty broad line of joysticks. At this point, it's the broadest line of joysticks in the industry. They should accommodate a pretty wide range of needs, and that being the case, they also are compatible with most electronic systems out there these days. The Precision Mini Proportional Joystick from Stealth is where we're going to start. So this is built with an aluminum housing, and once mounted, it creates a sealed joystick. So this is a really robust joystick. It makes the IDPMP ideal for clients who are going who are, who are just rough on their equipment or in other cases uh, being sealed it's good for somebody to use as chin control who has salvation issues uh, such as CP so the sensor and stick were originally designed to be used as a thumb control so as such it's got a pretty severe throw angle for a joystick of its size um, but it still works great in that application so it's best as a finger joystick, but works great as a chin. And we've got mounts to put it just about anywhere on the body that you want to go anyway. So it's a very, very versatile joystick and pretty robust at the same time. The mushroom joystick is ideal for clients with limited grasp and dexterity in their hands. It's designed for a customer who, who needs to just rest their hand or their palm on the ball and not necessarily focus on stabilizing that upper extremity. The ball fits in the palm of the, of the hand and allows the user to just rest their hand over the top. It doesn't require much dexterity or hand function to get around. It's available in two sizes and the large is going to be your standard size. The ball will accommodate a palmer grasp fairly easily. But if that's not possible, somebody with a fixed, contracted, fisted position can still control that joystick ball fairly effectively. It does not necessarily require a pincer grasp capability. The aluminum platform is designed to allow a user to rest their wrist and base of their hand or the palm and not focus on stabilizing their arm. So the client can rest their arm and the shoulder and only focus on using those fine motor movements of the hand to control that joystick. Or, likewise, they can rest their hand and their palm, not focus on those fine motor movements, but use gross motor skills to actually control that joystick. So it really helps us isolate motor movements into those two different categories and not have to focus so much on this joystick. Taking those two features, the ball and the slick plate, into account means that this joystick feels like a lighter force than it is. So we're at 227 grams of throw force requirement, where most similar joysticks of size require about 250, sometimes 300 grams to throw. So spec-wise, we're the same just about. Um, we have the same throw distance and throw angle as a standard joystick. It just appears to be lighter. The other thing that this joystick is great at is being used as a foot drive joystick. So we have some mounting options for that at Stealth. Um, it, it, they're usually custom, but we can mount it as a foot drive joystick. So it works great as that, and it's a little more intuitive than some of those gas pedal style joysticks. But hand and foot are where these, this joystick excels at. The Stealth Rim Control is something we do. So this is a rim control, um, pretty straightforward one. We've had this for years, 
but due to some contractual obligations, we weren't allowed to sell to anybody off contract. That's not the case anymore, so we can sell it outside of that contract to anyone, so we do offer a room control now. The nice thing with this room control is it gives you a proportional joystick and your headrest. So it is a complete proportional head control device. The other great thing, this has been around since the late 70s at least. So it's a very, very proven system out there in the world. So we do have a room control, keep that in mind. Um, and it'll give you that proportional feel, proportional drive. Getting into the Movis line of joysticks, the Micro is the world's lightest joystick, proportional or not. The isometric joysticks out there require at minimum 10 grams of force to even activate, where we require 8.5 on the Micro to start moving it. So that does make this the lightest in the world. The Micro is pretty similar in design to some of the other Micro and Mini joysticks that are out there, but it's had some improvements done to it. To start, the mounting has changed. Most of those other ones screw in from the bottom. The mount on this one wraps around the body of the joystick itself, making it much stronger, much more durable. The design of the gimbal has been improved as well, so it's a lot more durable. It doesn't fall out, essentially, as often or as easily as some of those competitive micro joysticks do. The micro is only available with this foam ball topper you see in the pictures or the small fingertip topper just above that interface there. All of Movis's joysticks are designed with several unique benefits and each one is going to have three different ports on it. So if you look at this interface in the bottom left corner here, you'll see a red, a yellow, and then just a USB port. So the red extends to the red jumper that you see in the picture there and that um, eighth inch mono is intended to plug into a power port on a power chair. And then your red jack runs your power. The idea being that that'll clean up your, your wiring and be less points for failure in the wiring side. The yellow port runs your mode function through your 9-pin. So this runs through the 9-pin of the chair and does not require a second switch to be plugged in to your display. You will, re you will need that second switch to plug into your joystick, but not in the display itself necessarily. Your USB port is going to be a programming port and you can connect with a Movis configurator software and start configuring this further for that user's needs and we'll talk about what you can do here in just a minute. You do have an LED on your interface. That LED is going to be a status indicator. When everything's happy you get a solid green and if it's not happy it'll start flashing a code. And in the user manual, you'll get an explanation or breakdown of what each code is. Coming in February, Stealth's also going to carry an RNET version um, of the multi and micro and all around. So here on the micro, um, I do have two part numbers listed. That dash R version is going to be the newest RNET direct version. So this is mainly international where RNET is still the by far the predominant electronic system out there in the market. Um, what it'll allow us to do is plug direct into the RNET bus and bypass the need for an input output module or a an Omni display. So mainly international but we will carry it domestically as well for those cases where it is uh, helpful for that customer. On the Movis Multi, same thing. RNET is going to come in February so there's where our two part numbers are coming from. But the Movis Multi is a joystick that was specifically designed to be a chin controlled joystick. It works great as a finger joystick and hand drive joystick, but it was designed for chin originally. So that being the case, there's a little bit of overlap in specs and force and throw with the IDPMP, but the throw angles and distances kind of make this stand out from that joystick. So throw force is a little bit of overlap angles and distances are what's majorly different being a chin drive joystick means that in neutral you can also depress this ball straight down in the center and it will it will depress slightly that doesn't serve any electrical function on chair but what it does serve is as a shock absorber 
So if I have a chin drive joystick and I'm bouncing around while I'm driving, this is going to absorb some of those harder blows and hopefully save some stress to the joystick and to the customer's chin. What it also helps with is mimicking that motion of the chin through forward and reverse and left and right because it is not a perfect linear motion, right? So that helps absorb all of that. The Multi right now is only available with this foam ball. From the factory to index this, your switch port should face to the customer's right. That can be changed in your configurator software, but from factory, switch ports to the right equals forward driving. The Movis All-Round Lite is an extremely versatile joystick. This is another one that in February we'll be introducing that Arnett Direct version, and this joystick is built with an extremely compact housing with about half the normal force and about a third the normal throw. What this means though is this joystick can be placed just about anywhere on the body. We have mounts to back that statement up with as well and that's where you get your all-round name from. It can be ordered with either a standard topper or the foam ball. Foam ball is typically used for your chin driving applications. Twister satellites can be added directly into the housing itself to give that customer more access or easier access to switches. So where this joystick really shines is somebody who has limited force or a progressive neuromuscular condition. So if we take ALS for example, it's a great option for that kind of a diagnosis. When the standard joystick is no longer functional for that customer, this joystick, number one, is lighter throw and easier to position. So we can follow their hands as they start moving midline, but it should still be easy enough to move and operate for quite a while. When the hands go all together and can no longer operate this joystick, it works great as a chin driving joystick. So it'll move up to the chin very, very easily and still keep that customer mobile and independent. So it's a great joystick. It's pretty versatile. It'll go all around the body. And does a lot of really cool things so you'll see it show up here in a minute as well the all-round joystick is a standard throw standard force joystick the deal with this one though the reason it exists is that compact housing so it's easier to relocate this joystick it'll fit into some interesting places that a standard joystick might not go so that is the reason for it a quick hint for you guys, deciding if you have an all-around or all-around light joystick, the easiest method to do that is just look at the rubber boot. So the gator or the boot, whatever you want to call it, under the joystick knob, if you have one, you have an all-around. If you do not have that rubber boot, you have an all-around light. The all-around is also uh, pretty significantly taller than the all-around light. Moving on, we get to the Movis All-Round HD. So this is going to be a standard all-round joystick with heavy-duty kit built onto it. So this is really a, just a robust, durable version of a standard joystick. It's going to have a drastically enlarged throw and force to it as well. And your joystick knob will not come off unless you use tools. At the moment, the joystick knob pictured is the only joystick knob we can offer. This joystick is really designed for those customers who are really spastic or have dystonia or hypertonicity and basically are just slamming joysticks all day long. So that mechanical disc on top of there for your heavy duty portion allows the mechanics of it, the metal, uh, metal portion to slam together before your electronics start to bottom out. So it saves it the electrical delicate components that way. All of this taken into account means Stealth can only offer this at the time being with a, with a Gatlin mounting. And that's the only mount we have at the moment that can hold up to that kind of a customer over the life of this joystick. 
Built into each one of Movis's joysticks is a feature called road compensation. This is a pretty unique feature that essentially means the joystick itself will sense excessive vibrations and reduce the speed of the chair. And this is in order to maintain control over that chair. So the idea is that this will help maintain control and let's, let's for example, take a front wheel drive chair. If I'm transitioning from a smooth sidewalk onto say a cobblestone road the rear of that front wheel drive chair can start to fishtail historically that's what would normally happen uh, tracking technologies have improved these days but still can be a problem right so for certain customers especially if i'm on a micro joystick with limited neuromus or limited muscular capabilities repositioning to slow down and gain control over that chair again is a lot of work, but more importantly, can be a lot of time. There are certain situations where time is not a luxury, especially if I'm trying to cross a street and lose control in a street. So this allows them to hold a full forward command, not spend the time to stop and reposition that whole arm just to move that joystick back a little bit. They still keep moving forward, and when the terrain smooths out, the chair begins to go at full speed again. So this is a really unique feature. It's disabled from the factory. Um, but if you go to our YouTube page, the Stealth YouTube page, or the Stealth website, there are there is a pretty good video on road compensation that's worth the time to look at. It's not very long, and it's really good at explaining exactly what road compensation is and when it's best used. Moving on to the mounting of the joysticks, we can kind of break it down into different families of mounts and different locations of mounts. So as a lip or chin or tongue, however you want to classify it, we've got four different families of mounts you can choose from. We can start with our iDrive control harness, and the control harness is a really unique system that was developed to allow that that joystick to stay with the customer. So you get some really unique positioning capabilities out of it, but as the customer moves and shifts and repositions throughout the day, the joystick is always with that customer, where if it's coming off a chin boom, that's not always the case, especially if I have a power recline. Um, shear reduction never keeps that joystick on the chin. In this case, it would. The power chin boom is another one. The power chin boom is from Movis. We'll look at it in depth in a little bit, but it gives you a motorized, independently operated power chin boom. The Gatlin series is our next. We do have it in a chin version that would allow for multiple different joysticks to mount it, mount to it, and be in a solid, rigid mount at your chin. Your headrest swing away systems as well are another option. So every headrest has the capability to add a swing away to it, and on those swing aways we can mount just about any joystick you might need to. Moving on to a hand or arm mount, we've got three basic families that we can classify them as. So our Gatlin series in either an eight position locking or a three position non-locking Gatlin. You've got your arms 260, and then you've got your TWB mount. When we get into tray mounts, we can do tray mounts for most of Stealth's joysticks, but keep in mind that some of them, like your all-around, all-around light, are going to be custom if we put it on a tray at this point in time. And then like your all-around HD, we just can't put it in a tray right now. One tip I want to point out on your Eclipse tray, if you want a hole drilled on your customer right, like we have in this image, you want to order an Eclipse tray with a left side hole. The idea being is that customer's left arm is going to rest on the tray and that left hand is actually what's steering or driving the chair. As far as tablet and display mounts go, Stealth has several versions. We've got three families here. So we've got Ramex mounts that are available for tablets and phones on the ARMS 260, the tablet holder can go on the display, or sorry, on the Gatlin mount as well. 
And then we've got multiple display mounts in all three versions, the Gatlin Arms 260 and TWB. Just keep in mind, the heavier the tablet or display, the more the, the smaller mounts are going to move. So if I have a super heavy iPad on a Arms 260, it will start to move if I'm trying to drive with it on that mount. So just keep that in mind. If you have something heavier, you're probably going to want to lean towards the more solid mounts that we offer. As far as getting something to that different mounting system, for most joysticks and displays, we have something that we can mount somehow. The Gatlin probably has the most options, but ARMS 260 and TWB also have capabilities here. So the general rule of thumb is if there's a joystick or display you need to mount, there's probably a stealth hardware that can do it. Right now the biggest rule of thumb or the biggest exception to that rule though would be for your newer Invacare Lynx electronics. We don't have anything that's compatible with that at the moment, um, but for the most part we've got at least one option for just about everything out there. So moving on to some of the other items from Movis that are not joysticks, we wanted to offer these as a complement to this alternative control family that we've built and Movis does make some really nice items that are just not joysticks. So we're going to look at these. So starting with the Movis Power Chain Boom. Power Chain Boom is a motorized mounting arm that can be mounted to a wide range of power chairs. Currently the Movis joysticks are the only ones compatible with this mounting arm. The unique programmability allows for you to define the amount of swing away up to 278 degrees. This means that the arm tucks away neatly behind the chair when not in use, so if you're transferring in and out of the, arm, of the chair, you don't have to worry about an arm being in your way. The speed and power that it has as it swings away is also adjustable, and when you combine that with the soft stop capability that it naturally has, that means the joystick comes in nice and soft and controlled to meet the user. Some of our competitive power chin booms in the market don't do that. They come in hard and fast, and if you're in the way, that joystick is going to punch you in the chin. This unit can be mounted to swing horizontal, so side to side, or vertical overhead. It can be mounted on the left or the right, and that is the most important thing we need to know when we order it, is is it a left or a right? The deal with that is the arm that comes with this is side specific and cannot be reversed. The power chin boom is also capable of outputting two commands to the chair. So with one switch, I can operate my power chin boom, I can send a mode command, and I can power my chair on and off, all with one switch. So I don't need m more switch sites than may be available. There's some other things it can do. Um, it can do quite a bit, but those are the main features of this power chin boom. So Get a hold of one, check it out, play with the configurator software, and that's the best way to learn what it can do. The Movis Multi-Switch is the last item that we're going to launch in February. So the Multi-Switch will allow for one input switch to control up to four output commands. This can help to increase the independence of the end user and reduce the number of required switch sites. It's not really suited for driving a chair, but it's great for mode commands or environmental commands, so like a door opener or something like that. Through the configurator software, this multi-switch can be set so that it clicks to cycle through. You can scan and hold or start and scan. So basically, you've got your white button here on your multi-switch. If you look just to the top left of that white button are four lights. Each one of those lights corresponds to one of the four outputs. So you can click through each one and you just hold it for a long command for it to output on the one you want. Or you can click to start it and catch it on the one you want or hold it and it'll scan through that way. And that's all definable in the configurator software. The outputs can be mo momentary or timed. 
and you can be between two or four outputs through this with one switch. You do get a debounce feature and audible feedback and all of that can be programmed as well. The Movis hand warmer is not something we see a whole lot of sales on down here in Texas, but it is a pretty beneficial item. So, when a user with certain diagnoses are exposed to cooler temperatures, they start to lose function in their extremities. So if I'm on a micro joystick with only three and a half millimeters of movement, the smallest amount of function loss is major, right? So what the hand warmer does is it's used to keep that extremity warm and functioning longer. The warmer is adjustable in the configurator software, so you can adjust maximum temperature, fan speed, set a timer, things like that. The dome is meant to be placed on a flat surface like a tabletop or a tray, and it's only ever going to be a two-handed uh, dome. You can trim the arm openings to fit something like a large coat uh, but basically what the dome does is trap that already warmed air and allows that hand warmer to circulate already warmed air making it that much warmer so moving on to the Movis configurator I keep mentioning this configurator software what is it exactly the Movis Configurator software allows anyone with access to further customize and configure and tailor that functionality of that device to that end user's needs. So each device is going to have its own set of unique parameters. So joysticks all share one set, chin boom, hand warmer, multi switch, they all have their own different parameters. The nice thing is once you connect, it's going to recognize what you plugged in and it's only going to display those parameters that you're concerned with. So you don't have to sift through joystick and power chin boom parameters to find what you want to change on your multi-switch. So it's a pretty clean and organized system in that way. So the Movis Configurator software is a free download on any one of Stealth's website pages that has a Movis item. That's typically the easiest way to find it. Just go on our website, find any page with a Movis item, and the download will be there. The link is always going to be the most up-to-date link and available software that we can put there. Movis does maintain that link, so check back every few months to make sure you have the most up-to-date version, as we don't know when it's updated, so we can't send out announcements. So just check back every every couple months, or every six months or so is probably more than enough. And just make sure you have the up-to-date software and you're good to go. So the next family of items I want to talk about is iConnect. What is iConnect, you might ask? So iConnect is a family of powered switches that can be used for a wide range of applications. Each version is going to eventually terminate into a mono plug. And from the perspective of the device that it's plugged into, it's just a mechanical switch. So while they're all functional on a power chair, it's not really going to shine very well there. It's, it works best when they're used on things like communication devices and environmental controls like door openers or power tilt on a manual chair, things like that. If an end user who can't use a mechanical switch uses a communication device, and needs to use a switch to, say, scroll through that communication device, iConnect's going to give them the ability to use a sensor or fiber optic or a sip and puff to cycle through there and use that communication device more effectively. Uh, things like bed controls are another option. So I could operate my bed with a sip and puff, for example. So iConnect fiber optic in proximity are available in 12 and 24 volt versions. Your 12 volt version is used on a manual chair or desk or bed application, so off power chair. Your 24 volt version is gonna pull from your power chair's batteries and that's where it gets its power, where the 12 volt is using a battery pack or a wall plug. iConnect fiber optic 
It is available in 12 or 24 volts. Each one's going to come with an independent power switch that will allow you to turn the fiber optic off separate from the power source. Each one's fully programmable in depth of sensitivity. Uh, you can turn light on, dark on, things like that. Um, it's pretty easy to tune these things. If you have questions, just call us up and we can walk you through tuning it. It's pretty straightforward. The fiber optic sensor head does not come with mounting hardware, so you'll need to get a mount for it. We have a few different versions available from Stealth, so when you order one of these, just make sure you discuss how you want to mount it um, if the CSR doesn't bring it up with you. iConnect Proximity comes in four different variations. So you've got a 12 and a 24 volt version. In each one of those, you can get neither one or two sensor variations. This is the same proximity sensor that we use in iDrive. It's just got a different plug on it. The sensor is adjustable with a set screw on the top edge, so you can change the distance at which it activates. They're not mounted but we could embed them in multiple different things, in pads, trays, uh, some sort of custom item that you may dream up. So keep that in mind again, these sensors are bare, but we could start embedding them. iConnect Sip and Puff is the next item I want to talk about. This is going to be a simple pneumatic switch that converts positive or negative intraoral pressure into a switch closure. There's no power required as it's just a simple switch inside of here and it's going to terminate into two plugs one for anything positive and one for anything negative the nice thing here is there's no calibration or anything like that uh, so there's almost zero training involved with this sip and puff unit simply give a positive or give a negative pressure so power sources for iConnect are available in a wide range of applications for your 12 volt applications We've got a wall plug and a battery pack. The wall plug is best for those stationary applications, while the battery pack is more ideal for something that's going to be mobile, um, such as an activity chair or a power tilt system where the customer needs a sensor to operate it. On the power chair side, 24 volts, we've got options available for QLogic, Arnet, and Mark 6. Just keep in mind on your QLogic side, your power source taps into your PTO harness. So in most cases these days, you will need a PTO splitter to run that power source plus uh, fender lights, for example. And you do have to get those direct from Quantum as Stealth does not carry the PTO splitter at this point in time. Some of the newcomers to your iConnect family would include your IC5 and IC6. The 5 and 6 switch box are relatively new, um, but what they're going to do is allow five or six switches to be installed and control directional commands, mode, and power, all on a power chair. They'll send switch signals, so they're pretty compatible with just about anything out there in the market these days. So the main purpose of the IC5 or IC6 is as an evaluation tool. These can be used to start mixing and matching different switches for different access sites to create a unique driver control for that customer. This will help prove that that user is capable of control of that power chair using that setup before you go to funding to ask for uh, an order. It's also compatible with switched output joysticks. Currently Stealth doesn't have any of those, but if you run across one and you want to use it with this interface, it is possible. The next two items I want to look at are not technically iConnect, but they, they fit best with this iConnect family as they serve a very similar segment of the market. So for many ECU model, modules, to do any output that's functional, you would need a DB9 to a mono harness. So that's what these are. So Stealth carries two different versions, one that converts DB9 into three different mono plugs, and one that converts um, a DB9 into four different mono plugs. So that allows us to connect from an ECU module sending different outputs across a 9-pin into either three or four different environmental devices like 
door openers or leg bag emptiers, things like that. One more item that's not technically an iConnect but serves a very, very similar segment would be your speaker. So the SPK100. The SPK100 is a speaker that gets embedded into a facial lateral pad to be used for audible cues essentially. So most often it gets paired with a communication device or a speech generation device. It's embedded very much in the same way as your sensors are and simply plugs into that device. Then whatever device you're using would control the volume. Uh, this doesn't get very loud, but you have a nice discreet way to get the cues from that device without having to put headphones on or anything like that. So bringing all of these things together and together with iDrive, which we'll talk about in a minute, we get into hybrid driving packages. Hybrid driving packages bring everything in together and really what they're designed for is somebody with a degenerative neuromuscular condition uh, such as ALS, they get everything in one package up front on one part number to follow that customer's physical progressions. So the end user doesn't have to wait for funding to come through after they've already had a change in condition or anything like that. Simply get somebody out there, make the physical change to the chair to match the change of condition, and there's, there's almost no downtime involved in that. So the goal with these is really essentially to keep that customer moving and independent with little to no downtime. So the less time they spend in bed waiting on somebody to come rearrange things on their chair, the better. So these parts are simply installed as needed and whatever's not used, the family can store for use in the future. Each package has been specifically designed so that everything can be configured in a number of different ways and all the parts are interchangeable and fit together. When designing this kit, Stealth turned to the all-around light joystick for a number of reasons. This joystick is again a very very versatile joystick that can follow this particular kind of a customer's changes through quite a bit of that progression. It can be used at the hands, the feet if needed, the chin, um, everything is there to do that with the hardware that we provide. Road compensation is built into here, which, especially towards um, the later stages of the progression, becomes a very unique and useful, beneficial feature for this population. And we can also add switches very, very, very close to your joystick knob. That means your customer has to move even less to reach them, so it keeps them more independent in that way as well. When we get into this first package, this first package can be configured in at least 32 different useful ways. So they all start with an all-around light. You get multiple switches to add to that all-around light and a couple different mounting options for it. So the all-around light can either be on your chin, your arm, and that arm mount could actually even drop down to your foot. On this version, this package, we also give you some hardware to mount a headrest with some lateral swingaways, add a chin boom if needed, and use some knee adductors as well. Getting into the second package, we add a little more to this one. So this package has the same things, it introduces this time so, uh, sensors embedded into those lateral facial pads, as well as an iDrive interface. So this kit, when you start adding it all up, can be configured to at least 40 different useful configurations. So with this one, with those lateral facial pads with sensors in them, those guys can be used in a multitude of ways. So you can use your iDrive with linked left-right mode, which we'll look at here in a couple of minutes. But we can use those to do left and right on say my knees. Um, so with this knee adductor hardware those lateral facial pads do swap over easily and 
the knee adductor pads do mount to your headrest hardwares. So we use the smaller three inch pad here on the knee adductors. It's not ideal to position a head with because it is a little big, but it works. And then this would keep your customer driving with their knees for quite some time should they want to go that route. The third package, um, we dropped back down to only 34 different configurations, um, but same idea. Same joystick options, but this time for your head, we introduce an iDrive Pro instead. So now, same idea. These sensors can be dropped out of your iDrive Pro. You can use your headrest pad that's included. Essentially turn your head array into a headrest for a little while. Use your sensors wherever you need to on your body, on your knees, your elbows, however you have to use them to drive, um, and stay independent. And then when the time comes to go full-blown head array, everything is still there to do so. So this brings us on to iDrive. iDrive is a product of Stealth's desire to always advance the technologies of the alternative driver control market. It was initially designed as a response to Stealth's question of why hasn't the technology changed and what can be improved upon. The long-term goal is that iDrive integrates with the technologies and functionalities that able-bodied individuals are used to interacting with on a daily basis. This is the vision we work towards with every change, update, and improvement to iDrive. By partnering with Trident Research, Stealth was able to take some major steps towards this long-term vision. Trident is responsible for industry-leading ranging and testing devices for the military. This made them uniquely suitable to execute the vision of iDrive. They bring a fresh understanding and perspective to the table on each project they're involved with. This partnership has allowed Stealth to develop iDrive into a modular driver control interface. It accepts a wide range of switches, sensors, and joysticks while being able to create driver controls that are individualized for each end user and their unique needs. One thing that sets iDrive apart from other driver controls is that it uses an actual CPU. The CPU allows for an extremely precise signal to the chair while being open for adaptations and configurations specific to each end user. Stealth has also worked with Trident to develop a new configuration application. This will help to open up configurability of iDrive while reducing confusion caused by the former softwares and applications. Previously, there were multiple programmers that all had different names, different functionalities, and different looks. All programmers now have the same name, same functionality, and will be installed following the same process. In addition to iDrive's configurability, Stealth has built in several unique features. This helps inch iDrive towards the long-term goal of granting an end user access to any able-bodied technology. We will discuss each of these features shortly. Moving on, we get to iDrive inputs, or what can iDrive actually accept? When discussing iDrive, it's important to start with what exactly is iDrive? iDrive is that central interface between the actual driver control and the chair, that rectangle box that's included with each iDrive configuration. iDrive is designed to work with many different inputs in order to achieve individualized outcomes. These inputs are also designed to easily work with each other or be changed out. So let's briefly go through each one of these. The first is the proximity sensor. Every proximity sensor from Stealth has the same adjustability to it. It's the exact same sensor regardless of how it's ordered. The screw is located on the opposite side from where the wire enters it, and that screw is where you adjust sensitivity. Next to the screw, there's also an indication light that tells you when it's activated. Moving on to mechanical inputs, every single mechanical switch is going to require a dongle. This is essentially an adapter that converts mono plugs into that micro miniature interface connection that iDrive uses. First switch I want to talk about is the egg switch. So the egg switch is a sealed switch that's going to provide some clear and audible feedback. Um, you'll also get some tactile feedback out of it. 
It's going to be offered in five colors to provide visual clues as to function for the end users in situations where you're using more than one. So these egg switches are going to have the ability to be mounted in multiple different locations with multiple different mounts. So uh, we've got several mounts here to choose from, but we can also embed them in Comfort Plus and certain other pads. When looking at the micro light, the micro light's a small light force switch that's suitable for users with pretty light or limited force. It provides some auditory and tactile feedback, not a whole lot, but it does. And it's going to come with multiple color stickers, so you can indicate function again if you're using multiples. So Stealth offers a couple of different flexible mounts for the micro light, um, either off a pad or a tray. Moving on to the mini cup, the mini cup is a small light touch switch that is ideal for embedding in pads or mounting in tight locations. The wobble switch is the next one offered by Stealth. It's activated in 360 degrees. It'll only trigger one closure in any direction. Um, so it's only going to be one function. It's not going to provide more than one, regardless of which direction you trip it. You've got a breakaway spring on it as well to help protect that switch. So if somebody is forcing past that activation point, they don't damage the switch itself. The Movis Twister switch is available in five different colors, but multiple variations. So the Twister on bent tube is very similar to Twister Satellite for the all-around joystick. The difference being is that the mounting clamp is different. So on satellite, you get a clamp that bolts directly into your all-around joystick. Where twister on bent tube, you get a little swivel clamp. Twister on bent tube is available in one foot or five foot cables. Then you have twister dome in the middle there. It's going to come with a small dome base that can be velcroed or screwed on to any flat surface. And then Twister Basic is just a small, simple switch with a plastic housing. So mounting that one, that Twister Basic, is a little tricky. Um, but it works great for, like, drilling into a tray and pressing it into a tray for a really low-profile switch. Another input into iDrive is going to be your IDPMP. So IDPMP is this same thing that was used on your DB9 version. The only difference now is that it's been modified to work with iDrive. So through iDrive, the joystick gains a few unique capabilities and configuration parameters, and it's, it's able to precisely calibrate to iDrive. So this calibration also serves as an active throw, so that the calibration is specific to each end user. So what that means is when you calibrate and it asks for your full forward command, it takes whatever the end user can push for forward as a full forward. So if it's only more like 85% instead of 100% of mechanical throw, that's now your electrical full throw. So what's more though, is that your dead band can be adjusted in each direction independently of each other as well. So it's very, very, very adjustable for your end user through iDrive. We have three different topper options available that are all screwed onto the stick itself. So in theory, they don't separate. We all know in practice that's not the case, but in theory they are mounted with a screw. They're interchangeable, um, but we know they do fall off, so we do now offer a replacement topper pack that's going to include one each of these three different styles. So due to the interpretation of proportional signals across a DB9 connector, the IDPMP can be used to create some unique hybrid control systems. That means we get to split this up and use it in conjunction with different inputs. So one of the plugs is for forward and reverse on that same plug. The other plug is for left and right off that same plug. So you only have two on this iDrive version of IDPMP. So now I can have something like a joystick for forward and reverse that's proportional, while my left and right can be done with sensors, say, on the knees. 
So it's going to use the same mounts and has the same specs and everything as your DB9 version did. Another input into iDrive is going to be your iConnect Sip and Puff. So same exact Sip and Puff module as before. So everything is still there. But what this does is allow for some unique hybrid control options. Again, where we could have something like a Sip and Puff for left and right and a joystick for forward and reverse if we, if we so wanted it. We do have the option of using fiber optics directly through iDrive as well. These have the same adjustability and programmability as the iConnect versions did. Everything uses the exact same amplifier. This time it's just terminated in an iDrive connector instead of a mono jack. As far as iDrive options go for fiber optic, you've got the IDH503 and the IDHF510 that are both iDrive direct. IDH503 is used in fiber optic trays, so the amplifier is bare. You don't have a housing around it or anything like that, so it does fit inside that tray easily. The iConnect fiber optic and the IDH503 all reliably sense up to about 3 inches. When we move on to your IDHF 510-1, it uses a thicker gauge of fiber optic cable and a sensor head, so it allows it to reliably sense up since up to approximately 5 inches actually. All of the self fiber optics get mounted in either flexible mounts or to mounts, lock line, things like that. Um, the other thing we can do is take four of those IDH 503s and mount them in one single box as well. When we get into different iDrive control systems, these are the different configurations you can actually order iDrive in. So iDrive is available in several pre-configured systems. These are more traditional driver control systems and require minimal setup and configuration in most situations. As an interface only, iDrive is still available. This is ideal for those situations when a customer is using switches from, say, another manufacturer or using iDrive for something off-chair like mouse emulation or as an evaluation tool in a facility. Alternatively, when iDrive fails in the field and it's not covered under warranty anymore, the interface option is more affordable than trying to get an entire iDrive system replaced. As a joystick setup, iDrive PMPJ, you've got a few different options. So you can order it as a standard item already paired with your ID PMP. This is going to utilize that advanced programming capabilities of iDrive, and it's also a pretty good starting point for building those hybrid driver controls. The ARMS 260 package is going to include mounting hardware for the ID PMP from one part number. So instead of parting this out to get all of these items, same idea as your hybrid package, you have one simple part number and everything is there. As far as trays go, iDrive is available in multiple tray configurations. So iDrive proximity tray is going to include four adjustable proximity sensors that can all be placed in the tray in the best position for that end user. So just be cautious here. Always be careful of your wire routing, your sensor placement, sensitivity, things like that. It's pretty easy to cause false activations of a neighboring sensor when sensors aren't placed in carefully. If you just slap them in there, you don't adjust them, you don't watch where your wires are going, things like that, uh, you will get false activations from a sensor that the customer is not touching at the moment. But these are great evaluation tools. They're great for starter driver controls, things like that. Um, take your time, and they're easy to work with. Fiber optic trays are also available with iDrive. Fiber optics are placed anywhere in the tray. Just specify the placement and Stealth will pre-drill it or you can drill it yourself if you'd like. And then finally we get into head arrays. So if you note that this entire time we've been talking about looking at iDrive, we didn't discuss head array up to this point, right? So iDrive is not a head array. That's what I want to make a clear point about. Now, iDrive is that box that's hanging off the back of the head array, but it is not a head array. 
So viewing it solely as a head array has led to some people really limiting potential possibilities and outcomes you can come up with with iDrive. And it seems to make the system more complicated in some eyes. So the only difference between a proximity tray and a head array is really that the, the sensors are embedded in a tray versus a, some pads, right? Outside of that, it's exactly the same. So the iDrive curved array is a modification of the original tri array. The curved wings make this variation a little more ergonomically correct, and you can get a little bit better placement of those lateral sensors. Each of Stealth's head arrays can be ordered with color contact, or sorry, color material on the non-contact uh, sides. So the curved head array also accepts the addition of swingways. So if you need more positioning laterally, we can then adapt to that as well. Or if you need more switch sites than what's provided here, you can also achieve that as well. Keep in mind here on the curved head array, the switch, or sorry, the, uh, the junior size is more like a standard adult size. Um, that rear occipital pad is a standard adult sized pad. So I would view your adult more as a large profile and your junior more as a standard profile. At this point in time, these are only available through Stealth. They will be available through Quantum in the near future. Your iDrive Tri Array is based off the Combo Series headrest. So it's designed to be pretty simple and clean and easy to deal with. But since it's designed off that Combo Series headrest, your lateral pads are flat. So in some situations, it may not be as successful as a curved head array would be. And those sensors are just a little harder to get tucked in closer, so keep that in mind. Uh, the tri ray also accepts addition of swingways for more support, switch sites, things like that as well. The iDrive Pro Array is going to be our most adjustable head array from Stealth. This does mean it's a little bit busy, it does have a lot of hardware nuts and bolts and things when compared to your tri ray and curved array. It can still be ordered with multiple contact material or non-contact material colors um, and comes in two sizes. So keep that in mind as well that the egg switch and boom, that the egg switch is mounted to do not come in your standard configurations. In addition to the Tri and Pro Series arrays, Stealth does carry head array Simple Puff combos in both series in pediatric and adult sizes in a standard part number. So this combo series uses a iConnect Sip and Puff to create a simple system with virtually no learning curve uh, and no Sip and Puff calibration process or anything like that. Moving on to iDrive programming, we're going to kind of take a deeper dive into programming here. So iDrive config is available for free to program in iDrive from a wide range of devices. In order to simplify that customer experience in the field, the previous softwares and apps are going to be phased out. Uh, that process has already begun. As support for older versions of Windows is ended, Stealth will also start phasing out the use of APS or advanced programming software. So iDrive mobile applications will be decommissioned. They already have been in the store and replaced with iDrive config. If you already have those older apps, the iDrive Mobile, it'll still function as long as it's on your phone. You just won't be able to re-download it if you lose it. Existing downloads, um, like I said, will function. So just don't, don't get rid of it if it's working and you're afraid to download the new one. So that does mean um, iDrive programming goes from five different apps that all look and function a little different to one single app that's consistent across Windows, iOS, and Android. In addition to a simpler process overall, the latest iDrive config introduces a couple of new capabilities. The biggest one is now that it will allow anyone with programming access to utilize the iDrive output style which best fits the end user's needs and configurations. So that change is simple in the field. Um, but just remember, it's going to require the latest firmware, which is 4.6 at the moment, uh, to, to change that parameter. It, it won't even show up if you're 4.5. I 
as such. Firmware updates are the other capability that iDrive Config introduces. So it's available through this app on Windows platforms. So getting started is pretty easy. The connection process to iDrive is simple. So open the app, click on connect, and select the device you want to connect to. You must enter a serial number when connecting over Bluetooth. Um, this is going to ensure security. Make sure that you're programming on the correct interface and you're not changing a different one that you don't want to be messing with, right? Windows devices may also connect over USB, and since that's a direct connection, serial numbers aren't really involved in that case. Logins should be stored in your device for up to 30 days. There's a few ways for that to not be true but usually it's about 30 days. So if you're entering a location where you have poor connectivity, log in before you go into inside the building and you're good. If you can't connect over Bluetooth, um, the biggest tip I can give you is save yourself a lot of hassle and a lot of time finding Bluetooth and just simply plug in and connect over USB. To make actual changes, you must log in first. So once you're logged in, configuration becomes active and you're ready to make changes. So you simply click on configuration and you get the screen we see here. So the first option under configuration is channels. This is where you're going to go to change what each port of the interface controls on the chair. So once you click on configuration, click on channels, you'll get a list of each channel. That list is also going to tell you if something's plugged in or not, so it will tell you disconnected if iDrive does not detect a connection. So that's a pretty useful diagnostic tool in and of itself. You can set each of these to one of the four directions. So forward, reverse, left, right. You can set it to none. So none would be for training purposes. So if you disable, uh, if you disable reverse, for example, we don't run the risk that somebody, instead of simply unplugging it, we don't risk the possibility that somebody can come by, plug it back in, and all of a sudden that customer is driving in reverse when we don't want them to be. You also have a proportional forward and reverse and proportional left and right. This is going to be for your IDPMP at the moment. You have safety switch and safety switch halts output for iDrive once it's activated. Sensor sensitivity on the bottom there is not sensitivity as most would define it in this industry. So this setting is defining more of a response time between the sensor and iDrive. So this window is really only a few milliseconds long so adjustments are not going to be noticeable. The only true sensitivity adjustment is the set screw on the sensor itself. So what this is really doing is when you activate a sensor between activating it or unactivated not touched and touching it there's a an arc between sending signal and not right and what this slider does is define where on that curve does I drive count it as active and that curve is really really short like a few milliseconds right um, if you do slide this slider all the way to the left you run the risk that the sensor will not activate all the way to the right, it will stay constantly activated. Anywhere between those two extremes is going to give you noticeably the exact same response. Um, it's going to be imperceptible that it's different. When we go and set only linked left right, only linked, or sorry, only left and only right we get the unique function of iDrive that's called linked left right mode. Um, so when those are only assigned it'll appear if you have anything else assigned like a forward or a reverse linked left right mode goes away. So that's that little slider button right above your sensitivity slider now. What that'll let us do is build a system that drives with two switches. By setting your chair up as if it's a three switch head array, for example, the user will have the ability to drive in all four directions. So left will drive left, right will do right, both together does your forward, 
but a quick tap of forward will do your reverse command. Um, on QLogic, you can do a double left, for example, for your mode. So you have complete control out of two switches. Back in your very first menu, configurations, your next live option down is going to be mouse. So if you go into mouse control or mouse, what this allows us to do is change um, change how your mouse pointer actually functions when using mouse control. So mouse control is built into every every iDrive a license is required to function, and we'll discuss that in depth in a minute. This menu here allows you to define how that customer is going to op operate that emulator. So this emulator function is best for your three switch configuration where one switch is always going to move the mouse up and down a second one will always do left and right and those two are going to always auto toggle so you hit it once mouse is going to scroll up let off hit again mouse is scrolling down and then your third is going to be mouse click and um, these can be assigned to any active channel in iDrive When we get into configuration and um, proportional forward and reverses, when a channel is set to proportional forward and reverse or proportional left and right, the joystick calibration icon or parameter becomes alive once powered. So this allows the joystick to be calibrated to iDrive, and when calibrating, the throws are treated more like an active throw for the user. So if forward command is only pushed about halfway, that's your new max. Under channel assignment, there's also a deadband slider. And using that, you can adjust center deadband for each direction independently. So for example, if I'm looking at this forward purpor sorry, proportional forward and reverse assignment, that channel deadband slider, if I slide your left button to the left, that's going to open up deadband in reverse. Sliding your right slider to the right opens up center dead band for forward. And same is true for your left and right. Backing out of that calibration gives me our next option down, which is multi-tap calibration. So multi-tap calibration allows the iDrive to measure multiple mode activations from an end user to get a precise time. Since time's used for a multi-tap delay, which we're going to discuss in a few slides from now. Chair calibration will allow a proportional output I drive to precisely calibrate to the chair. So now we're calibrating inputs into iDrive, iDrive into chair, and that creates an extremely precise system. It's not really, chair calibration is not required for iDrive's using a switched output however. It will still be live, but it's not required. Your device name is another option you can get in and change under configuration. So this is a pretty helpful option. The name that displays on the connection menu is what you're changing here. So this can help make it easier to identify a specific iDrive when multiple are powered up in range of your phone or PC or whatever you're connecting with. So if I enter a clinic, they've got five iDrive users in a row and they're all powered on at one time. If I go to connect to one over Bluetooth, I'm going to see five different iDrives that all are labeled as iDrive. So changing the name here makes that a lot simpler to decide which one I'm connecting to. So when I Go next item down is actual multi-tap and mode. So multi-tap and mode allows the iDrive to really extend the double tap function of the chair itself. And when iDrive was launched, not every chair had a double tap feature that was actually configurable. Pretty much all do now. Um, at that time it was double tap. It's now called multi-tap so that iDrive can allow a triple click of the mode switch to enter into mouse emulation mode. So most often, this ad parameter is adjusted on the chair and not on the iDrive side. I would say a good rule of thumb is to leave multi-tap disabled until you absolutely know you need it enabled. 
input delay is going to set that time window that iDrive waits for multiple mouse clicks or mode clicks. And then output time is how fast those multiple commands are sent to the chair. Factory reset allows iDrive to be restored to the default parameters. So if you make a bunch of changes to your interface and you need to go back somehow, you don't know what you did, factory reset dumps you back into how it would have left from stealth provided that no major changes were made. So this is going to put you back to square one, undo all the changes, and everything goes back to a factory setting, which is more like a four switch head array state. So this doesn't change your output style that you chose though. And just keep in mind, iDrive works out of the box. It's a four switch head array out of the box. It's easy to, to throw on a chair and go. Um, so that does set you back to that with one click. I do talk about output quite a bit here, right? So let's talk about it. Output is a configurable selectable parameter now. So this is going to allow you to change the output to what best fits each situation. Sometimes proportional is better, sometimes it's not, right? We've all ran across those situations now, so we have a pretty good idea of when to use each. And this change is a very quick and simple process now. Previously, you had to send your iDrive back to Stealth, and we had to do it in-house, and then send it back out. So you're looking at a two-week process. It takes about 10 seconds now to change your output style in the field. So simply select the desired output, cycle your power. Once you come back on, the app's going to connect to that iDrive again and you're done. That's all it took. So keep in mind again though that iDrive or sorry, iDrive output changes are only available if you have firmware 4.6 or newer. At the moment 4.6 is the newest. So the speed slider here is here for future use right now. It's not going to do anything. Firmware can also be ad updated through your app. So I keep mentioning you need the latest firmware for this or that. Right now, we're only going to allow firmware updating over USB. Bluetooth has been proven to be a little too unreliable here, and it takes quite a while. So over USB um, means you can only do it with your Windows app. So um, this process is pretty straightforward, though. The general rule of thumb is that if a functional system is good everybody's happy happy with it and there's no need to update then so the only reasons to update um, if you want to use loons you need version 4.5 if you want to use um, a selectable output style you need version 4.6 so if you're version 4.3 and you need loons or different output update it and you're good to go but if it's working everybody's happy there's no need to go ahead and re Re, uh, redo the firmware. But this process takes about on average 45 seconds over USB. So it's a little quicker than updating a chair. So your diagnostics view here is a pretty interesting view. You get a lot going on. There's a lot of information here that can be helpful for multiple uses. So coming back to that very first screen out of configuration, we can also select diagnostics and this is where we get to do all this fun stuff. So it's accessible without logging in. So since we can't make changes here, um, a user could download our app and see this screen as well without getting a login from us. So active throws or activations are going to be displayed in green. Keep in mind that these displays are only what's being sent into iDrive. Right now we don't have a way to display what's coming out, we only have a way of showing what's coming in. So we can tell if our sensors and switches and joysticks going into iDrive are good. On a quantum system we're good because we do have a monitor feature in QLogic 3 that allows us to monitor what's coming into the chair, in this case what would be coming out of iDrive. RNET does not allow for that. When proportional inputs are installed, 
that green light will scroll in relation to how far that input device is thrown. So it's pretty useful for identifying those problems with the inputs and things like that, obviously. Um, your center circle that's red right now will be green for mode commands. It's going to be red for your safety switch activations. And then last, there's a little bit of device info on the bottom of the screen here. So your system voltage is what's going into iDrive on voltage. Your firmware is the version that is lo loaded in that iDrive at that moment. Um, for everybody that's curious, then your firmware date there is just the day that that firmware was published. It's not necessarily when it was loaded in the iDrive. One of the more unique things that you can do with this screen is do some training. So uh, once the driver control is installed, this can be kind of used to show successful voluntary activations before that user's turned loose to move through that environment, right? This can also be used outside of power wheelchairs to define or identify those access sites and start working on building that repetition and repeatability, reliability in those switch sites before you put them in a power chair. On chair programming can be pared down into two main things essentially. So setting up an iDrive on a power chair really only involves telling the chair what you just plugged in and if it's proportional calibrate it. And that's it. Outside of that you're going to be fine-tuning for that customer. So there's a lot of steps to get to those two things, um, but that's really all you're doing. Tell it what it is, calibrate it if it's proportional, and it will drive. Um, then fine tune for each end user's needs, and you're good to go. So um, we, we tend to focus on programming on chair a little too intensely and make it overwhelming. Um, like I said, there's a lot of steps to get these two things accomplished, but that's all you're really doing in all those steps. So, so the next item I want to talk about is iClick. Each iDrive 4 is capable of mouse emulation. It's going to be a Bluetooth mouse emulation. And iClick software is pretty much just a simple mouse emulator for a three-switch configuration. The setup process was designed so that anyone can install it. It can be done by an end user or their family and it shouldn't require any specialized training to do so. So this is a pretty straightforward mouse emulator out of iDrive. It's going to give you full screen navigation and complete control of mouse clicks as well. The software does have a license and that software license does have a cost associated to it at this point in time. Once you purchase that license, it is tied to a specific iDrive. It's tied via that serial number. And that license can be used on an unlimited number of PCs. So if I have a head array and I need mouse simulation, I'm not tied down to only using it on one, one PC. I can use it on multiples, right? And the same being said the other way around, if I have one PC sitting in a classroom with multiple mouse simulation users, so long as there's different um, there's different logins and profiles for each user, that one PC can use multiple licenses. So how does the mouse function? Um, one major benefit here is as an emulator is the speed and ease of entering and exiting mouse in mode. So long as that iDrive is in range of the computer, it's just a triple click of your mouse click assignment, which is typically mode, and your iDrive jumps straight into mouse simulation mode. It's already going to be paired to the, your PC and everything's good to go. So you pull up to your device, one, two, three, you're using your mouse at that point. The chair will not drive until mouse mode is exited with that same triple click. So this is why earlier when we were talking about multi-tap and mode, um, or sorry, multi-tap and your multi-tap delays. This is why I mentioned that it's best if we leave that turned off unless absolutely needed. The fear is if I'm driving along and I accidentally click three times within that multi-tap window, 
my iDrive is going to try to enter mouse mode and suddenly my chair is not driving for some crazy reason right so on the end user's part that's kind of confusing and difficult so leave that multi-tap off until needed the mouse will be able to perform an auto toggle up and down or an auto toggle left and right both of these are going to be out of two separate switches and then your configurator software allows for your um, for you to assign those two switches so using this configuration with those two switches you have complete navigation of your screen we have end users who can draw a really nice circle um, I cannot but we do have some users out of two switches who can draw a circle so you get pretty proficient with this pretty quickly the mouse click assignment is able to accomplish all clicks as well as click and drag uh, to move or select multiple icons and then we get into loons so let's look at loons so loons is a great opportunity to get the driver control in other products in front of your customers earlier in the process so you really get that first chance to make that first impression here it's designed to allow an end user of alternative controls to practice those skills needed to drive or operate a power chair. It's great for selecting those driver controls and configurations without putting that end user at risk of injury by unintentionally or uncontrollably driving their power chair. It's currently only available through iDrive on an iOS device, on an Apple device. The plan is we will expand this to Android and Windows as soon as possible. So the original goal was to find a way to safely train users of alternative driver controls to drive a power chair. This can be done on their existing equipment such as a manual chair or stroller or even molded systems in cases when you don't have a suitable uh, demo chair available. Stealth has envisioned this as the first of a series of training games and adventure games that will allow those alternative drivers to build their skills in a fun and safe way. So to do this, Stealth did team up with Trident once again. iDrive will need to have firmware 4.5 or later to connect to Loons. So the general rule of thumb here is if you can get into Loons, go to the connect menu and you can find iDrive on connect but you get an error every time you try to connect your most likely culprit is the firmware version so go back check your firmware make sure it's 4.5 or 4.6 at this point and you should be good to go so loons is going to have 16 stages in total each is going to introduce a new environmental factor and start testing new and different skill sets when you get in there the display is going to have a few things going on with it. So it's going to show the coins collected, how much time has elapsed versus the time limit, as well as a help overlay that provides some visual cue as to what that objective is in that level. If you select the gear icon up here in the top right corner, you do get some options. In options, your character speed will affect your time limit. As you slow the character speed down, the, char the time limit will increase. So at 0 to 50% of the total speed, you will have your full specified time. If you go over 50%, so say up to 100%, your time limit is only roughly half of what it could be. So that time limit just increases because the character takes longer to move across the screen. The help overlay option here, set to enabled, if you disable it, your large red arrow or arrows disappear. So if that's too much and distracting or anything like that, set help overlay to disabled. And then as far as color modifications and things like that, um, all the device manufacturers like Apple, for example, since that's what we work on at the moment, have put a lot of time and energy into color modifications and we can never match that so if you need it to be black and white or you need certain color hues to be 
muted uh, to make this a little less intense for certain diagnoses, you can do that through your device settings. So that is something we can do. Um, it's just that device does it way better than we could ever try to do it. As far as coins go, most levels do have coins that can be collected and once you collect it, it's going to test their skills in doing so. You don't always have to collect it though. So notice here the coin's still floating up in the air. I have a zero of one coin collected, but the stage is cleared. So my overall score will be penalized here in this case. Once I hit level nine and up, we're gonna have we're gonna have uh, vines. So watch out for them. You get too close, and the balloon will pop. So the idea here is the administrator can determine if that user is gonna struggle with potentially laying on a switch or joystick and not recognizing that they need to move off of it to be safe and avoid problems. When I get up to about level 14, I get vines, or sorry, I get gravity. Uh, vines are still there though. So the more coins you grab, the faster your balloon starts to drop on its own. So prior to this, your, your balloon only moves where you tell it. So if you say straight up, straight left, it won't drop. Here, I'm having to control him and keep him back up as he's trying to drop when I go left. It's hard to see in just a video when you're not playing it. Um, but So this is to simulate that the chair is veering and the need for a course correction. I can, though, go into that landing pad and drop coins off to lighten that load so that it does drive a little more normal compared to what it would be. When I get to level 15, I still have vines, I still have gravity, but now I have wind. And the wind is going to randomly come in from both right and left sides and push me all around. So this is really going to simulate some randomized veering, uh, such as driving across a curb cutout on a sidewalk. Um, so by this point, we're really testing a lot of different skill sets of that driver control. After the stage is finished, either by meeting that objective or time running out, popping a balloon, any way it's finished, you will get some results generated. So notice here that the the percentage um, of coins was 0%, so my overall score was reflective of that. So if you click on statistics here, you get a lot more detail. This screen is going to show precisely what the end user told the driver control to do. So if we know that a given level requires one sustained forward, and maybe one sustain left to complete, so only two presses. With these statistics here, we can safely assume that there are some things that are going on that we still may want to keep an eye out on and keep working on before we just turn them loose. So if you click send results here, it's going to automatically generate a CSV file. So this info is going to include precision, coins, your time, your overall score, the number of each directions, but then also the time you spent holding each one of those directions. And then it'll tell you your preferred direction from all of that. So these are pretty useful for tracking progress over time. One thing I always want to caution though is if you'll notice in this set of results, I have no way to tell what level this is from. So I would suggest when you're emailing, if you're trying to track over time, give yourself a clue, email level one results or say level three results, something like that. So you know what you're, you're trying to track here. So Stealth is putting final touches on some Loons packages as well. So this is going to be everything that someone would need to use Loons. They come with everything from as little as an iPad and a TV to a complete iDrive system with mounts, switches, different inputs, things like that. They could be purchased by facilities who are actively using Loons to help increase its effectiveness or usability. So the, the Loons basic kit is going to allow a customer to, 
who owns a compatible iDrive system to connect to and use Looms. So the iPad's going to run it. The TV is ideal for projecting it for larger areas in case that customer has visual impairments or you have a large group that wants to view. Your joystick kit is going to allow a customer who already owns a Loons compatible phone or tablet to connect to Loons and operate it with a proportional joystick. So that joystick can be mixed or matched um, with different proximity sensors or egg switches that come in the kit and you can create that hybrid driver control that really better targets that user's needs and access sites. And then last, your proximity kit um, is really a kit that's going to come with proximity switches and egg switches so you can mix and match with just the switches and sensors. There is a Loon's Complete Kit as well that's a little bit of everything. So this is going to be interface, sensors, egg switches, trays, things like that, various mounts. So it's a pretty complete kit that allows for um, basically someone to start from scratch to use loons when they had nothing to start. We do have a video or two of a user using loons and trying it out and learning their driver control. So go check it out when you have time. It's again on our website or our YouTube page. And that brings us to iDrive VR or virtual reality. So VR is going to introduce a more realistic and real-time experience than Loons while still allowing that user to gain practical experience in a safe and fun way. It's designed as a complement to your normal interventions, therapies, and assessments. It's not a replacement. VR is a great opportunity to get those driver controls and other products in front of your end user earlier in the process. This can be outside of the power chair, on manual chair, or activity chairs, for example, in a bed even. So you, again, you get that first chance to make that first impression with that end user. So in building upon the ideas behind the diagnostic view behind loons, VR takes driver training and assessments to that next level. So you, the user's body will be tricked into feeling the sensation of motion while they're sitting still. Stealth teamed up with a local, uh, local stealth company in Underminer Studio who specializes in creating tools and experiences in a variety of applications using VR and AR. So this allowed Stealth to focus on developing the concept and direction of the experience while Underminers did all the heavy lifting in building that system and creating it in a reality. In designing VR, Stealth wanted to ensure that this is a clinical and viable tool and there was evidence to support it. So research has indicated that there are benefits to in including VR in the assessment and training process. So Cooper has shown that VR can be a valid representation of driving capabilities in a real, real world environment. Multiple other studies have shown that VR can be used to complement the traditional training process and achieve improved results. VR has shown to potentially improve the assessment process in a number of different ways. So time management is one. Um, it allows you to practice skills in a controlled environment, minimize those needs for an assessor, typically a therapist, to be present 100% of the time. VR can also provide those documented results of the assessment and help reduce the time documenting results, right? Um, The VR was really designed to be an experience in a seated stationary position, making the environment very controlled and very safe. In theory, a user could practice VR as long as they needed. Uh, they don't have to necessarily stop because a therapist was late for their next appointment. That system could be set up in their hospital bed, for example, and they could practice all day long. How does VR fit into a typical assessment? Well, VR is going to help address a couple of major challenges in many assessments. So having appropriate equipment that the end user fits into is, is always a challenge. So VR 
allows that clinical team to try and train on various methods and driver controls in their existing equipment. The VR system is also much more compact and easier to house uh, than, than most power chairs, right? It does not require a power chair to be used, so that further increases those two factors. In the last many cases, assessments end up outdoors. There's just not room for them to try and practice driving in an indoor place in that, in that clinic, usually. VR is stationary you still get those benefits of trying to drive and practicing that driver control but not physically moving through the world so it eliminates that barrier altogether. While traditional training methods are still recommended, VR has been shown to improve outcomes when used as a complement to those. So going back to the space and environmental challenges in the training phases VR has very little space and user the user is stationary. So VR does not necessarily require skilled administrators such as a therapist. While a clinician is treating other patients, the user can continue building those skills on their own time with some minor assistance by virtually anyone. So this VR system will allow the user to be introduced to various driver controls in virtual environments that increase in complexity over time. To keep that experience as true to reality as possible, a true 3D model of a power chair was used, and not just any power chair, but an Edge 3 power chair. So when you're going through a door and you see in the VR system that you have one inch of space, for example, on either side of your power chair through that door, your power chair is true to real dimensions. So we try to keep it accurate in that way. So VR doesn't really replicate a real experience in a real power chair, right? We're not physically moving through the world and there's no way to replicate that physical movement. The client should still demonstrate and practice skills in their power chair, but VR can allow the user to continue practicing with the driver control to build that controlled repeatability and reliability out of those various methods. So iDrive VR is going to use the modified version of an iDrive interface. So using the standard version leaves potential that the user could accidentally be in a chair, plug into your into your iDrive with your VR goggles and cover your eyes while in a power chair leaving room for them to accidentally drive while their eyes are covered so we cannot have that happen so we modified an interface so that that cannot be a possibility and stealth can provide a pc but it does require a pc that's been optimized for vr so it's got to have graphics cards and everything that's capable of running vr for it to be realistic um just a standard computer just doesn't have that graphical horsepower to handle VR and then we do provide a, a VR headset if, it, if somebody does not have one. So moving on to the levels themselves you've got three main environments right now. You've got a gym, an outdoor area, and a home environment. So these levels were really designed after several power wheelchair skills tests. At, as the experience is updated and continues to grow, more and more of those skills test elements and objectives will be added. Many of the objectives and elements are written into the plan already for each level. Uh, they just have not been implemented as of yet. In the future, Stealth would really like to introduce more environments, like an urban area where you have to cross sidewalks and streets and things like that um, with people and traffic. Uh, things like getting in and out of a bus or um, or public transportation, things like that, or a van even. So we want to start looking at other environments to add as well and still keep it practical and realistic at the same time. So the first level starts in an open gym, gym environment much like you would with a regular assessment, right? So it's really designed so the end user can try and decide multiple different driver controls and demonstrate those basic, basic skills before you move on. 
So there's five stages that def test different skill sets. Moving, moving on to some updates, Stealth really envisions things like various distractions to slowly start being introduced. So right now we've got a decent base, but we definitely do want to build on this. Level two takes your user into an outdoor environment. So you start getting more obstacles and terrain changes are introduced. So you're still testing new skill sets with every level. There's there's already some distractions built into your outdoor levels already um, in, in the form of waterfalls and some, some birds and scenery and stuff like that. In future updates, we want to start doing things like small bridges to simulate uh, navigating ramps, for example, um, things like that. So we want to start introducing more and more here as well. In level three, we get into our home environment. So the, the user now has to demonstrate that they can successfully navigate in the home. It's going to be tight spray spaces. Um, you got to show that you can appropriately handle doors swinging to and from that person. And you got to be able to pull into a table uh, back in next to a bed, which I personally haven't been able to do yet. Um, so in future updates, self, again, we're looking to add things here. We want to add more obstacles and distractions, uh, maybe get more involved uh, levels in the kitchen area or the bathroom area, things like that. So um, we want to keep improving this. We, we welcome the feedback, um, and we're looking for it. So packages with VR much like your loons packages we do have some self VR packages these are already available uh, for different needs so you've got your basic with a PC and a headset so if you already own an assessment interface we've got a package that lets you do VR the joystick package is everything it's going to take to use VR with a joystick pretty straightforward same with proximity everything it takes to operate with switches or sensors and then the complete packages again VR assessment interface, PC headrest or headset, and then various different mounts and um, configurations of iDrive. With VR, I do like to point out um, between Stealth and Underminer Studios, it's is starting to win several awards. We've got multiple awards now, um, been featured through Intel a couple of times now as well. So it's getting out there. Um, we've got a few videos of what people, their reaction to using the VR has been. So I'd recommend checking it out. And again, they're on our page and on our YouTube page as well. So go check them out when you have time. Just see what people think of iDrive and VR in specific. One thing to note about actually using VR is that some newcomers to VR may experience some motion sickness and VR motion sickness really occurs when your eyes tell your brain that you're moving in an environment but your body feels that it's sitting still in a chair right or standing still so there's there's a lot of science behind that motion sickness in VR it's pretty complex but really what kind of boils down to is that what you feel in motion sickness is is basically a fight between your different senses trying to figure out what's going on um, your your vestibular system is pretty pretty upset um, it's it feels you moving but you're not moving so there's a big confliction there visual inputs are telling you you're moving but your kinesthetic inputs are just saying hey I'm sitting still so um, there's there's a mixture of contradicting signals that are just kind of too much to understand and digest at once for some people so that results in some nausea and other unpleasant symptoms in some cases. It's not going to happen with everybody. Uh, the, the younger the kid is that's using it, typically the better off they're going to be. Um, I'm not great in VR if I just jump in and go straight for it. But to fight this, you can start out slow. So allow time for your body and brain to adjust to, to that environment. So... At the start, um, sit in, in the VR and just look around for a little bit. And it's something like two minutes of, two or five minutes of just looking around in a VR space. Adjust your body to being used to that and ready to move through that world. 
Um, if you start to feel motion sickness, just close your eyes and take a minute, right? Remind yourself that what you're feeling is pretty normal at first, and, and you're going to be fine. And you're going to get over it pretty soon once you get used to it. You can have a fan pointed at your face. That helps some people as well. Um, but if all that fails, just unplug the headset, set it on a table, and use your PC as your viewing screen. So it won't be as immersive, but you still get to try that um, that driver control. You get to use that driver control in, in a different world. So it's still beneficial in that way as well. Um, but yeah, there's there's plenty of ways to get around the motion sickness. And not everybody's going to feel it. I think we're looking at probably 50-50 if you're going to get motion sickness or not. So that's it. So that's everything alternative driver controls from Stealth right at this moment. If you've got questions or concerns, feel free to contact me. Shoot me an email, and I'll try to address it as quickly as possible. But again, uh, sorry this one was so long, but thanks for your time. Let me know if you've got questions. Thanks.